Maria Fontanelle, everyone. Uh, when I'm not cosplaying as Princess Leia, um, I actually am the <laughs> associate curator at the Cary Graphic Arts Collection, which is the rare book library at RIT Libraries. And actually, I'm in it right now, as you can see. Beautiful reading room here. Uh, so the Cary Collection at RIT is a collection that is strong in the history of graphic communications. And that includes materials like rare books uh, related to the history of printing, graphic design, and archives related to the book arts, calligraphy, typography. Uh, in recent years, we have been collecting material that is related to the history of comic books. And this is such a fascinating period um, and period in publishing history because of the the graphic design involved, the artwork involved, and also the publishing of different kinds of interesting literature as it has come up in the 20th century. So as we've been doing this, uh, our first comic book collections were collections related to um, a fellow named Stephen Neal Cooper, uh, who collected everything published in comic books from um, April 1956. And this has expanded greatly to support different classes at RIT uh, related to comic book literature, the, uh, the making of comic books as it's something that our students are so engaged in. Today, May the 4th, Star Wars Day, we are celebrating our collection of comic books published in first 1977 which is the beginning of the Star Wars comics era that went along hand in hand with the launch of the movie franchise. We're very fortunate because Carrie Collection was given the full suite of over 100 Star Wars comics from this original uh, publishing endeavor by a donor named Don Lombardo. And uh, because of this extraordinary day and extraordinary time, we wanted to share these with you, which have recently been digitized. So today we have a, a lecture event planned. We have three speakers and they are going to give a little tour of our Star Wars comics at the Carey Collection and also some history and backstory about the comic books and Star Wars in general. This portion of the event is going to be recorded. Uh, we also might be recording the chat section so right now everybody is muted. Uh, and if you do have a question, my colleague Elevon Holtum will be monitoring the chats and you can type those questions in the chat and we will attend to those after our speakers. So just, uh, I think we will get into it. Thank you, Ella, for uh, putting the links to the comic books that we have there. Let me introduce our speakers quickly. I will uh, do their full bios when it's their turn to speak, but our speakers today are Svea Elisha, who is an RIT photography senior, class of 2020, woohoo! Um, also, Dr. Daniel Warden from the RIT School of Individualized Study and Department of English, and Dr. Trent Hergenrager from the Department of English. So, Without further ado, I'd like to call your attention and uh, Svea Elisha will be sharing her screen. She's a graduating RIT senior in fine art photography. She works at the Carey Collection as a digital imaging assistant where she's responsible for uploading images and metadata into the RIT library's digital collections. To date, she has published hundreds of the Carey's artifacts online so that the public may view them. So today I wanted to have Svea kick us off and uh, please give us a tour of the work you've been doing in uploading the Lombardo Collection, Star Wars Collection. For Thanks, sure. Svea. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Oh, I cannot share my screen. I have been disabled. But, um, to start us off, um, while Amelia is uh, figuring that out, either way, I can share my screen or Amelia might be able to just share the collection. I was just going to show what is uploaded right now to, awesome, uploaded to the RIT Digital Collections, which is a recent, recent initiative that we launched um, 
the beginning of this year, I believe, when I first joined, it had been brewing and was officially launched. So what we're seeing right now is the current upload that we have of all of the comic book covers. Um, the entire books are not scanned in yet, um, but these are just the covers of about around 40 of them. Uh, uh, my goal for this year before, you know, everything had happened was to scan in the entire collection, but that did not quite happen. And actually, I've been just uploading and um, JG is another, uh, he is a master's of fine art photography student here at RIT and he works as our collection photographer at the Cary and he has been actually digitizing. So scanning is what we've been doing with these on a flatbed scanner. Um, and then I take the covers and I add their information and then upload them. So this is the slew that we have uploaded now. Um, and this is the first one that we've got. And I thought I would just do a quick demonstration of our system, which I think is so cool, especially um, with these types of comic book covers, because you can zoom in to, oh, hello, there we go. You can zoom into quite a great length, and for the quality that JG has been able to maintain to upload, look at that, you can even see the Bende dots, and you can see them upload. Yeah, there's, there's Leia, and it takes it just a second, but you can see, uh, you can get great detail, which I think is one of the most exciting things about our system, is you can really inspect um, the artifacts that we have uploaded to some, some very reasonable amount of detail. So I think that's very exciting. Um, and then aside from that, and everyone can access, I believe, uh, I'll put up the link so everyone can peruse this at their own speed, um, be able to zoom in and out and see the, the interesting little things that happen in each cover, which I think is so entertaining. I think it was one of the most entertaining projects I worked on. I think the expressions of each character is so wonderful and I think that they're so varied. Um, and that's it, I think, for me. Thank you so much, Faya. Um, I know we'll have a chance to drill down into a few of your favorites when you uh, scan them. There's some interesting Star Wars personages in there. <laughs> so uh, we'll have a chance to turn right around to that. Uh, next up, I'd like to invite Professor Daniel Warden. He is an associate professor in the RIT School of Individualized Study and the Department of English. He focuses on the study and analysis of uh, American culture, literature, art, film, television, and comics. Uh, Professor Warden teaches some very popular classes like comics, images, and text in popular culture, and another one called Making Comics. So Daniel, please give us the backstory about the Star Wars comic series that started in 1977, and thanks for coming. Yeah, uh, thanks Amelia. Um, this is a lot of fun. Uh, so yeah, I thought I would just talk a bit about um, kind of how we get to Star Wars number one and then what happens in the comics um, after that. Um, so one of, the, um, one of the fun things I think about Star Wars, especially teaching Star Wars, is that Star Wars is, a, is I think a very self-conscious kind of mashup of a lot of popular genres that have been circulating around American culture since uh, since the late 19th century. Um, and, and Lucas, and especially the people that um, that scripted and drew the Star Wars comics, that initial Marvel run, were very aware of this. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of kind of genre, popular genre elements um, in the series at large that for me at least most meaningful, meaningfully can be traced back to um, late 19th century dime novels in America, um, where we really see the kind of mass publication of, of Western narratives, kind of early sci-fi adventure kinds of narratives in series like Frank Reed Jr., who was like a boy inventor um, in a kind of steampunk story before steampunk was a thing that people um, used as a genre category. And then later, um, pulp magazines that kind of lead us directly into comic books um, in American culture. Um, these are just a sampling of the genres that were that were popular in the pulps, uh, from detective stories like The Shadow, a kind of precursor to Batman, um, jungle adventure stories like Doc Savage, um, a precursor to something like Indiana Jones, and of course, somebody like Flash Gordon, um, where we get the kind of full um, space opera suite that Star Wars would very much play in. 
Um, and then by the time we get to comic books, uh, which emerge in the United States around the 1930s, um, we can begin to see the, all of the genres that would kind of go into making Star Wars, Star Wars. You have something like Planet Comics um, on your left there, that's a, a science fiction comic. Um, Pirate comics were a were a subgenre uh, in especially golden age comic books, and there's a lot of um, piracy themed stuff uh, in Star Wars. Of course, um, it's a maritime uh, narrative in some ways. Um, <clears throat> obviously, Knights of the Round Table, Sir Lancelot, Robin Hood, things that would become kind of mainstays of the fantasy genre. Um, are in are in the comics on newsstands, and of course romance, and sometimes even romance plus western, um, like in frontier romance. Um, all of these things would um, kind of get mashed together um, by Lucas um, in the creation of Star Wars. And in our own carry collection, Amelia mentioned the Stephen Cooper collection that that preceded the great Lombardo collection that that we've been getting recently. Um, in that. In that collection from 1956, we again see a kind of comic book prehistory to Star Wars. Um, early film adaptations, we, we see here um, Dell's uh, comic book adaptation of the Alexander the Great Technicolor film, comics like The Black Knight, an early um, pre-Marvel comic published by Atlas, um, uh, wartime comics, The Fighting Air Force, teen romance comics, things like Maisie and Archie, and of course the great sci-fi comics of that mid-century period. And all of that would kind of lead to the 1970s moment. Um, and these are just examples of the ingredients that would go directly into the Star Wars comics in 1977. The original artist on Marvel Star Wars comics um, was an artist named Howard Chaikin. Um, and on the left here, um, this is a cover from Star Reach uh, Magazine, a comics anthology magazine um, that was published before uh, Star Wars came out. And then Chaikin was working on a kind of science fiction slash pirate story with his main character named Cody Starbuck here. Um, Chaikin has said in interviews that this was the reason that he was given the Star Wars assignment by Marvel um, because they were impressed with his Cody Starbuck work. In the middle there, you see Marvel's um, Conan the Barbarian uh, that was written by Roy Thomas, um, who would script Marvel's initial Star Wars comics and who was a kind of longtime editor uh, at Marvel at the time. And then on the right here, we see a, an adaptation of a film that precedes Star Wars. Um, Jack Kirby famously returns to Marvel in the 1970s in this period and one of the first books that he wants to do for Marvel after spending some time at DC um, is to adapt Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Even though that film had been released in the 60s, it's almost 10 years old um, in the mid 1970s. Um, but this would kind of lay the groundwork uh, for what the Marvel Star Wars comics uh, would look like. And then we get, of course, Star Wars number one that we've already looked at uh, in some detail. Um, this first issue was uh, written by Roy Thomas um, based on the screenplay uh, of the film. They hadn't, nobody who made this original adaptation for Marvel in 1977 had seen the film yet. It wasn't complete. Um, so they were going off of storyboards for the film uh, and the script for the film. Uh, written by Roy Thomas, um, penciled and inked this first issue by Howard Chaikin. And in the comic itself, it's, it's kind of great to look back at these. Often in comics world, we view, we sometimes erroneously view adaptations and what are called licensed comics, that is comic books that are about kind of pre-established, usually television or film, increasingly video game properties. Um, we usually view those as being typically kind of bad or secondary, um, that artists and writers are really just kind of getting a paycheck for doing that kind of work that has a guaranteed audience, but it's not really their passion. But in this original Star Wars comic, we do see some uh, really interesting bits of comics storytelling um, that are brought to you by um, like Chaikin and Thomas. Like in this page, it's kind of famous sequence from the film, you probably remember, uh, where C-3PO and R2-D2 go wandering off into the desert. Um, they split up and R2-D2 gets captured um, by Jawas, uh, 
and here we see one of the classic great things that comics can do, uh, where as R2 goes off, we just have C-3PO talking in the background through that word balloon that's just kind of there as the action that has nothing to do with C-3PO. In fact, the whole point is that they're separated. Um, we still hear him prattling on in the background while there's something going on in the images that is very different than what's going on in the text. This is something that comics can do really well that films sometimes mimic with voiceover. But with comics, there's something nice about the visual juxtaposition of image and text here. There are also great moments because, especially the original adaptation of A New Hope, was based on the screenplay rather than the actual film. There are things that are in the comic that would be cut from the film. So we get some classic like Star Wars nerd tidbits in the original comics. Like for example, we learn uh, Luke Skywalker's uh, uh, adolescent nickname um, here in this dialogue. Luke Skywalker's nickname on Tatooine is Wormy, W-O-R-M-I-E, uh, which is just a little detail that I love. It's like a little bit of like Lucas's American graffiti right here in Star Wars that like Luke Skywalker's kind of like a whiny spoiled adolescent kid um, and his nickname's Wormy and he's not as cool as his friends. It's a little bit of like Archie comics um, in that world. Or this sequence, this is like my favorite bit of Star Wars number one. If you just kind of, this is the famous sequence where Darth Vader force chokes an Imperial officer, like a classic Vader move. But if you just pay attention to the images and just ignore the text, you'll notice in the first panel on the left here, there's like a floating cup of coffee and then in the second panel, Vader's holding the coffee. And then the third panel, he's doing it too. So I just love things like that. Like it's never mentioned in the dialogue that he's like making himself a latte and serving it to himself while he's force choking this Imperial officer. Um, there's just something there that I love. I remember loving it even as a kid and then wondering like, how does he drink the coffee? Is there like a straw that he uses? Does he just like dump it into his mask? Um, you know, there's a great, uh, there's, there's just a great, Kind of series of questions uh, along the kind of classic Star Wars nerd questions like, you know, where's the cafeteria and the Death Star? Why doesn't everybody, why doesn't anybody ever go to the bathroom in the Millennium Falcon? Those kinds of things. Like, why does, why does, uh, why does Darth Vader make his own coffee here? Um, you also get some other moments that settle some longstanding uh, Star Wars debates. Um, in the original Star Wars adaptation, there's no doubt that Han shoots first uh, uh, in this uh, Moss Eisley Cantina confrontation with Greedo. Um, <clears throat> and we also just get some really beautiful um, elements uh, as, again, this is evidence that you can tell that nobody who was making these comics originally had seen the film, so they didn't know how to draw hyperspace. Um, they hadn't seen that effect um, in the movie yet. Um, so the first use of hyperspace in the comics is this really interesting kind of color bar um, setup that they have as the Millennium Falcon um, jets away that I think of is just a really beautiful image, but very, very different than the way that hyperspace would be represented uh, in the films kind of canonically in Star Wars. So looking at these old comics can kind of give you wonderful things. The adaptation of A New Hope ends with issue number six of the Star Wars comic, but it would continue on. Um, and they would immediately, the, the Marvel team that was producing these comics would immediately begin inventing new characters um, to kind of tell new stories in this brand new Star Wars world. And one of the famous, maybe most notorious characters that inter is introduced very early on is Jackson, who's the green bunny that you see here in, on the cover of issue number eight. Um, and he would return in 2015 in a variant cover here where we're seeing him being locked out of the new Disney Star Wars canon that I think Trent is gonna talk about a little bit more in just a moment. <clears throat> when, the, when the comic was released, um, these are some images from a panel at San Diego Comic-Con in 1976. Um, everyone expected at Marvel that the Star Wars movie was going to be a flop. Um, they didn't think that it would be super successful. Um, but they did a panel about it um, at San Diego Comic-Con with Roy Thomas and Howard Chaikin that you see pictured here wearing their Star Wars t-shirts. Um, to uh, what was reported to be a kind of partially filled auditorium um, at San Diego Comic-Con. People didn't know what Star Wars was. They weren't super excited about it. Um, it was still a relatively new thing and Marvel was taking a bit of a risk and doing this comic. But as we move forward in comics history, 
um, <clears throat> there are a lot of kind of interesting ramifications. Chaikin, the artist, uh, I think he drew the first 16 issues of Marvel's Star Wars series in the 70s, would go on to make uh, American Flag, which was his kind of auteur comic in the 1980s, that existed in that beautiful mid 80s period where we see mainstream American comic books kind of become literature um, with things like Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns and Sandman and American Flag isn't talked about often in the same breath as these comics, but was nonetheless a really important kind of auteur adult comic um, in this same mid 80s period. By the 90s, the license would shift to Dark Horse Comics, who would produce uh, a couple decades of Star Wars material, including the prequels. And then in 2015, um, when uh, Disney acquires both Marvel and Star Wars uh, from Lucasfilm, uh, the whole Star Wars franchise gets rebooted and relaunched with a new Star Wars number one uh, to kind of complement that 1977 Star Wars number one with the new Disney canon. But uh, like the original 70s uh, Star Wars comics, these new comics would continue to kind of introduce new characters. Um, so one of the main new characters that's been introduced in the new Star Wars series like the old characters that were introduced only in the comics is Dr. Aphra and her two droid companions, first introduced in Star Wars Darth Vader, um, and then she gets her own spin-off series, and of course, because it's Star Wars, she gets her own action figures shortly thereafter as well. And this is a character that I think so far has only existed in the comics, um, in the new uh, Marvel Star Wars comics. And even Jackson the Green Space Rabbit from the 1970s has returned um, in contemporary Star Wars comics um, in IDW's uh, Star Wars Adventures, which is their all ages Star Wars comic. Um, Jackson appeared in the 2018 annual. Um, so all of these old kind of weird characters that were kind of introduced off the cuff in the 1970s, they continue to kind of interestingly trickle in and be a part of Star Wars as we know it today. Okay. Thank you. That was amazing. I think uh, you've made a lot of us uh, fans very happy today, Daniel. Thank you. <laughs> a lot of great information. So I uh, just want to remind you, if you're just coming on, to, to please type your questions in the chat, if you, and we'll get to them after the uh, third lecture here today. And that is by uh, Professor Trent Hergenrader, who is, comes to us from the RIT Department of English. And uh, he's currently researching role-playing games and how their storytelling capacities can be used productively in fiction writing courses. Professor Hergen Rader runs waitlisted creative writing classes at RIT, such as game-based fiction and world-building workshops. So thank you for coming today, Trent. Thank you for having me. Uh, so right, I'm Trent Hergenrader, Associate Professor in the uh, Department of English. I'm also a life, lifetime uh, Star Wars nerd. I teach a class I'll talk about in just a second called Transmedia Story Worlds, in which I start off with a picture of me as a four-year-old wearing a Jawas t-shirt uh, and regale them with a, a story of my mom dropping us off uh, at Empire Strikes Back at the front door of the movie theater when I think I was, I would have been eight. Uh, and they don't let parents do that so much anymore. Uh, but anyway, you can see, you know, we went as Halloween a couple years ago, and my son, Grayson, it is his birthday today. He turns 11. He is uh, May the 4th be with you birthday. So he's very, very fortunate on that. Uh, as Amelia said, you know, I primarily teach in uh, creative writing, fiction writing. Uh, a couple of the classes that you mentioned, the world building workshop and game-based fiction ties into uh, my interest in how do we construct large-scale fictional worlds? How do authors do that? Uh, and that sort of led me into, and I'm, I, in the literature and media classes that I teach as well, uh, I taught genre fiction in the past, focusing on Tolkien's Middle Earth and George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire series and the continent of Westeros. Uh, and then I developed this class that I've taught for the last three years, I think it is, Transmedia Story Worlds. It focuses on the Star Wars galaxy. So as a creator myself and for teaching students at RIT, I'm really interested in this question of uh, sort of the scale and scope of large uh, story worlds, and there's probably none bigger right now than Star Wars, which is sort of let, led me to developing this class in transmedia story worlds. 
Uh, to get sort of what's unique and interesting about Star Wars, I want to just break down what a transmedia story world even is, what all these different component parts are. So trans, of course, is a prefix that means across or beyond, and media is a means by which something is communicated or expressed. So whether that's print or film or a video game or a comic, whatever it is. So uh, transmedia storytelling then is telling a single story using multiple platforms, multiple modes of delivery. And we can see too that this, the reason why transmedia story wor uh, storytelling and story worlds have, have really sort of gathered pace in the last decade or so is because there are so many different ways to be able to distribute media. So I, I've told students before in my class as well, I can do 100% of the content of the class, read novels, watch TV shows, watch movies, um, read the comic books, all from my iPad, right? And I can download all of that instantly. So that's something that, that is really uh, unusual in this time uh, and place. Uh, a story world then is a shared universe where the, all the characters and settings and things like that and actions, all of the narratives are existing in that one, wor one world. So then when you put it all together, you get a transmedia story world, which is a shared universe where there are multiple stories and almost nece necessarily multiple authors because story worlds are so big, you can't just have one person uh, creating all of the stuff, multiple artists, and they're dispersed across multiple platforms and formats. And you can think about in terms of the, the sole authorship question, just how much grief George R. R. Martin has been getting because he can't get the next novel out, right? So the TV show has already lapped him. Uh, and it's just a question of how do you, how do you have audience demand uh, that, you can, that you can satisfy in a commercial way? And the answer that, that Disney and Star Wars have used is to have multiple authors across multiple different forms of media. So you always can get uh, the stories going out and the cash coming back in. Now, one of the things, too, that I like to um, explain is that there's a difference between adaptations, story world adaptations, and extensions. So when we look at something like Middle Earth, uh, J.R.R. Uh, Tolkien's Middle Earth, it's almost entirely adaptations because the uh, family of J.R.R. Tolkien, the J.R.R. Tolkien estate, has sort of locked down the stories that can be told in Middle Earth. So when we get an adaptation, usually there's a novel and then we turn it into a movie or a comma, uh, comedy, or sorry, a movie or a drama or a stage play or something like that. And then we also do novelizations where we take a film and then turn it back into a, a novel. An extension is something different where it seeks to add something to the existing story as it's moving from medium to medium. So this is something too that we'll see Star Wars is really, really keen to do. Now this is more rather than either you're an adaptation or your extension, there is sort of a, uh, uh, a way that adaptations as they chop and change uh, they add new things in order, they combine characters, they add new things in order to make the story work for that new medium. So every kind of adaptation is always going to add a little bit new, but extensions are supposed to be entirely new, entirely unique. Oops, all right, there we go. Uh, another couple of concepts that I wanted to mention because this all sort of comes, comes together uh, is canonicity, continuity, and coherence. And the idea of canon is that there are things that are true throughout the entire story world. If you're gonna write a story for Star Wars and it's gonna be official canon, then that means it's gonna be true all over the place for every form of media. Uh, so there's also the question of continuity, meaning if you're gonna be dropping in a story that takes place between two other uh, pre-existing stories, the, the narrative needs to make sense and it needs to have a continuous narrative flow. And then finally, there's coherence, just logical interconnections of story elements. So if you bring in kryptonite into Star Wars, does that sort of confuse things, right? It's sort of an incoherent thing. So one of the fun things about studying a massive story world like Star Wars is we've got Star Wars, uh, A New Hope in 1977, and then we go in the story world, we go back in time for a movie that's made in 2005, uh, Revenge of the Sith, Episode 3. So then when you make Rogue One in 2016, you're dropping it between these two movies, and you got to try and make sure that there is that continuity, and you grab from canon from both of those other movies to try and uh, make sense of it all, right? To make it all coherent, and even though um, audience members know what came before and what comes after, it's a storytelling challenge to try and say, okay, I'm going to fit this, this piece in the middle. Now, back when George Lucas, prior to Disney purchasing uh, st uh, the Star Wars property in 2012, there were lots of novels, lots of comics, lots of things uh, that were, there was no real attempt at canon. Everything sort of existed on its own, and George Lucas was totally fine with that. He just said, you know, the things that I make are going to be canon, everything else is fun. So the, the comics that we have in our collection, for example, are interesting takes on possibilities within the Star Wars world that didn't need to sort of match up with anything else that was happening in, in the story world, whether the novels or, or other things like that. Um, but when Disney acquired Star Wars in 2012, 
they effectively shelve all of that. So they negotiated with Lucas and they basically said, we're going to keep all six movies, the original trilogy and the prequels, and then the Clone Wars TV show, which is, I think, up to six episodes or six seasons and had 120 episodes, I believe. All the comics and novels were then shelved. They weren't deleted. And this is one of the things, too, that fans get really angry about, that they got rid of it all. They actually shelved it so they can selectively take parts of it that they want because there, it was so messy. So one of the things that came out with this press release that Kathleen Kennedy was saying is that it's moving in this new direction in which it's all going to be connected, right? So in that second paragraph, um, they're going to be continuing the Star Wars adventure through games, books, comics, uh, and other forms of media that are just emerging. And this is all interconnected storytelling. That emphasis on all of this stuff is actually going to have to make sense, sense together. Now, this is one of the things that I think is also really exciting. And as I design the class and this content just keeps getting bigger and bigger and I need to be more selective, the, the most interesting things that I think are happening in Disney is when they do the reboot and then they're focusing on this period between the prequels and the, the uh, original trilogy. And one of the main characters is Ezra Bridger, right? So it's, he's literally the bridge between these two uh, major eras. But you can see that while it was still, whether canon was still, the rebooted canon was still relatively small, they could do some really sophisticated things. So here we've got three different forms uh, of media. We've got a novel, we've got a graphic novel, a short run graphic novel, and then we've got uh, the episode of Star Wars Rebels. And you can see the dates that these are coming out, that they're sort of staggered. But what we see here in A New Dawn, the novel on the far left, it's meant for adults. Uh, it, it has the hero Kanan Jarrus, who is sort of the, He's called the last Padawan because his um, his Jedi master was murdered during Order 66 uh, at the end of Revenge of the Sith. So he's run away. He's a loner. He's an alcoholic. He's basically doing criminal activities. Uh, and he eventually learns, he meets Hera Syndulla, who's another major character in, in Star Wars Rebels. And this novel is more or less him beginning to learn to trust in other people. He's been on the run for so long and not wanting to take any responsibility that it's a real journey for him, even just in this novel, to start to learn to trust other people. So then we get uh, in The Last Padawan, this two, it's a two volume series, a short run of uh, the story of Kanan's backstory, it sort of intersperses with some of the, the moment, uh, the, the present moment in. Uh, Star Wars Rebels. But we can see that here's the moment in which his master, Depa Vilaba, dies when she's protecting him when the clone troopers turn on, uh, turn on the Jedi. And, he's, and she says, go, I'll be right behind you. And that's the last word that she speaks to him before she dies. Now in Star Wars Rebels, towards the end of the, the first uh, season, things are going very bad. Their plan has gone terribly wrong. Uh, and then Ezra Bridger is the Padawan running away and Kanan says, you go, I'll be right behind you. And there is this resonance between you know how much he's come. If you've read the novel, you've read the graphic novel, you know what a powerful moment this is. It's powerful a lot, uh, enough if, if you're just watching the TV show. But then you get this extended sort of sense of who this character is and why this is so powerful, even in just this word, if you tie into all these other forms of media. And this is really where transmedia extensions are the strongest. If you don't know that if you don't know these things, these other stories exist, it's fine, it's powerful in and of itself. Each bit that you add, it's like a little bit of Easter egg. It's, a, it's something new that you learn and you can feel very self-satisfied that you can start to make all of these transmedia connections. Now, when we talk about canonicity and the fact that uh, Disney is very interested in keeping a core canon, right? One of the things that's interesting to think about is the percentages of which all the material forms the canon. So the Star Wars films are 25 hours if you add them all together, which is actually the smallest portion of the overall canon. The Clone Wars TV show and Star Wars Rebels, I haven't even put The Mandalorian in here, are both almost twice as long as all the films. When we get to the comics, if you start thinking that the film adaptations for like Rogue One or The Last Jedi um, are about six comics, you start doing the math, there's 292 original comics, which don't include any of those adaptations. That's equivalent to about 49 films or 98 hours. So if you want to be the, per the smartest person in the room who knows all your Star Wars stuff, you need to read all the comics. You need to watch all the TV, right? It's, you have the people who just watch the films and they think they know everything. So the comics form a, a huge, uh, huge portion. And it's also multi-authored. So what you get is um, lots of interesting takes in different aspects of the Star Wars universe. So we get the Kanan comics, like I mentioned before. Another one that I like a great deal is Obi-Wan and Anakin that uh, is set very close to the end of episode one in which it's uh, more about the development of their relationship. Uh, Disney also came out with the Age of Republic comics where we get Qui-Gon and a bunch of other things that are happening prior even to The Phantom Menace. Uh, 
Uh, the Darth Vader comic books are really good. That's sort of taking place in that Rebels era in which he is sort of transforming from the old Anakin and burning that away and becoming more Darth Vader. And then also Disney is doing uh, everything in, in our sort of uh, the last, or the uh, Force Awakens era with Poe Dameron. Uh, they have a Phasma comic as well. So there's all these different moments in which they can tap into and then add these extensions, add these new stories that are not just adaptations, but they're adding new things to how we understand a character like Darth Vader, like Obi-Wan Kenobi, or like Poe Dameron. Now, one of the things, too, that I think is really interesting and worth delving into the comics, both in the Carrie collection and then some of the comics um, that I've used in class are actually uh, in reserve downstairs at the, the library as well. Um, but one of the things that I like a lot about the comics is as you start to delve into this broader media sort of narrative, that there's a lot more experimentation and pushing the edges that happen in these, in these media that are not the films or even TV. So we get Dr. Afra, who uh, Dr. Warden mentioned Dr. Afra just a minute ago, but you know, her sidekicks are murder bots and like an evil Chewbacca, right? So that would not fly with, I think, mainstream, you know, the big mainstream uh, uh, film, film crowd. They also have one of the things that people have been really pushing for is more same-sex relationships in uh, the, in the uh, films. And this is something that you can see at the bottom in which Dr. Afra shares a kiss with a uh, female Imperial uh, commander who is out to get her and they have sort of this moment of bonding. So I think that, you know, the comics are able to push the edges and sort of do some more politically interesting things because they know that the audience is, is somewhat smaller. And we also get a fun uh, sort of tie in with uh, this character, Sana Solo, who apparently Han Solo uh, allegedly married and then sort of immediately broke up with. And we also get uh, Ray Sloan, who is a commander who, if you read through the Aftermath novels as well, she's uh, just somebody who is continually, as the empire starts to crumble and fall, she finds ways to get promotion after promotion. So you can see that there's some th interesting things here going on with race and with gender and with uh, sexual identity and sexual orientation that are happening in the comics that would not probably be able to be done in the film without you know, major sort of outcry or people, people pushing back. So they're worth delving into for that aspect as well. All right, so that's uh, just sort of my final sort of statement is go ahead and dig into those comics that we have, uh, both at the Carry Collection and then check out some of the new things that are happening in the Star Wars Marvel uh, collection that, that's now been rebooted. Uh, and I guess we'll move on to questions now. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. I, I particularly love that pie chart where the super nerds really need to read all the comics in order to be qualified as that. So um, Comic up. That's what I, I tell people too, that the reason why I started doing all this was my son was watching the Clone Wars TV show on Netflix. And one day he came in and said, I know more about Star Wars than you do. And I was like, what the hell you do, right? I mean, like I, I grew up with this stuff. And then I started thinking about it. I was like, wait a minute, if the canon works that way, he actually does. And I needed to re rectify that immediately, right? He was not, so now I can blow him away and, and you know, I know way more than he does. And he's 11, so, you know. Um, so I think what we'll do is move on to the questions and thanks everybody for participating and sticking with us. Um, I had a question here from Jeremiah. I don't know if you want to say it yourself, Jeremiah, or you want me to. Yeah, I, I can say it. Uh, okay, great. It was just, just that, you know, I have not read the entire story arc of the Marvel Star Wars comics, so I was curious. And uh, I think John showed us uh, earlier the Marvel Comics adaptations of the canonical film. So my, my question is around how smooth or bumpy was that dropping into the canon world and then coming back to the comics world, especially maybe after the Empire adaptation that happened midstream in that run? Uh, I can answer that because I just, I just went through them recently. It's super bumpy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So Empire... I think it's issues, it's in the issue number 40s. I think it's like issue 40 to 45 or something. So the Star Wars comic had been had been going for over three years. It was published monthly. And then all of a sudden they just transition and issues number you know 40 to 46 or whatever are adaptations of Empire Strikes Back. Um, it, it's jarring reading through them now because um, the art style completely changes. Um, there are all of these kind of establishing uh, illustrations in the Empire adaptations that are clearly drawn from either the concept art, the, um, the movie posters, or just them having seen the film themselves that time. 
the adaptation is much closer for Empire. Um, and so I think, I think the film was available to them in a way it wasn't for the original. Um, and so all of a sudden, you know, there's been three years of these like weird Star Wars comics where Marvel, Marvel writers are just making up stuff to happen in the sandbox. Um, and it feels, it made me, going back and reading these made me appreciate especially the Mandalorian TV show and the solo film a bit more because you see the roots of a lot of that kind of villain of the week kind of structure um, and the idea of like space pirates and, and gangs uh, and things like that. That's what the comics really were once they moved past the, the screenplay from A New Hope. And then they just abruptly shift to Empire um, where things happen a lot faster than they happen in the comics. Um, and then they just abruptly shift back to like, you know, there's a, there's a Jedi Knight in the original Marvel Star Wars comics that's, that's called Don Juan Quixote. And he's like an old guy in a suit of armor with a lightsaber. And like to move from something as goofy as that and Jackson and the Green Space Bunny to like Empire Strikes Back. And then you just quickly return right to like Jedi Knight Don Juan Quixote. Um, is, is pretty abrupt. And then for Jedi, I think in the, the comics that we just saw showed this, uh, with, when Return of the Jedi comes out, Marvel chooses to do a limited series adaptation. So they don't fold it in to the comic series. I think maybe in part because they can sell more if it's a limited series and a new number one, but also they can then, I guess, maintain continuity within the Star Wars title. It doesn't then eject you out of it as quickly. Thank you. Yeah, I just add on to that too, that I'm not that far. I kind of gave up the star, the main Star Wars uh, comic is probably one of my least favorite because of all of these reasons, because I think it, um, uh, you know, just has all of these weird sort of continuity issues. But in some of the early issues uh, of that, Luke, it, it takes, it sort of starts right after uh, Star Wars and before Empire Strikes Back. And Luke confronts Darth Vader. They like run into each other. And I think, and I'm reading that, I'm thinking that drains all of the emotion out of Empire Strikes Back. If they just saw each other yesterday, like that confrontation is not as big of a deal. So I really do wonder sometimes why, uh, you know, why they, why they would go there, why they would do those things. But I, you know, and the students too in the class really strongly believe that the best sort of Star Wars material is the stuff that's getting away from the original trilogy. And just, because you can't, Dr. Offer really can't, violate too much canon because she's off doing her own stuff so it's sort of, that, that's sort of another interesting question too to look at is what spaces do these different forms of media uh, choose to explore and you know the comics are some of the the richest in terms of getting away from what we may expect from from star wars thank you so much um we have another question here dave uh de primo do you want to ask it or do you want me to go ahead for you sure i can do it Great. Um, so because the original series, you know, they worked from the screenplay and they didn't have all the visuals and things like that, obviously there was some stuff that like based on canon would be wrong, like, you know, Ben Kenobi's red lightsaber on a bunch of those covers, things like that. I was just curious if there was any pushback from Lucasfilm or, hey, you guys need to fix this, or, or they were just kind of said, you know, this is the world, like run with it. Yeah, the... There's a, that's a really interesting question. So on the, in, in 1977, um, according to all the Marvel Comics histories, um, the Star Wars comics essentially saved Marvel from bankruptcy um, in the mid 1970s. There was a severe downturn in comics readership during that time. Marvel at that point was about 15 years old in terms of like that, that moving from that Fantastic Four Stan Lee moment to 1976, 1977. Um, and Marvel was in dire straits. And Roy Thomas convinced Stan Lee to kind of take a leap with the Star Wars adaptation. Um, and they, they cut a royalties deal with Lucasfilm or what, whatever Lucasfilm was at the time. I'm not sure if they were using that name. That Marvel would get all the royalties from, I believe, the first 100,000 comics sold. Um, because they thought that they weren't going to make enough money off of the deal. Um, and then, of course, it ended up being their biggest seller for a decade, um, that comic series. Um, <clears throat> so I think the relationship, at least in the beginning, was, was pretty good. Um, one of the things that having these original comics in the carry allows us to do now is to kind of figure out answers to like the one you've just asked. Marvel is notorious for 
uh, digitally recoloring comics that they reprint from their archive. Almost every collected edition that you buy now of classic Marvel comics has been digitally recolored. And so one of the things that we can do that we, that we previously weren't able to do is to kind of look at the original printing of these Star Wars comics and compare them with um, you know, Marvel's contemporary reissues of these old ones that have been digitally recolored. And we can kind of look and see what they're bothering to go in and correct. And that kind of, uh, th those kinds of projects can give you a kind of interesting barometer to see just how closely Lucasfilm is paying attention to what was happening in the comics. Because certainly in the 70s, they really weren't. Um, but now, um, it'd be interesting to go back and see if they are, in fact, correcting some of those errors, if certain stories are kind of slipping out of the reprints, um, those kinds of things, which we know comics publishers do to preserve continuity. Thank you. Great. Um, there's uh, one more, and I also have a question too. Uh, John is asking, where through the comic series do you see Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey? Any Either one of you, Daniel or Trent, or any of our, our guests today can, can answer yeah, that. I could take a swing at it, because this is, sure. I could answer this for probably like an hour and a half if you wanted me to. Um, but one of the things that I've talked about before, <laughs> one of the things I've talked about before is that George Lucas very deliberately made the original Star Wars as sort of a black and white, the good guys are good, the bad guys are bad. And this was really in response to films like The Taxi Driver, you know, and other very edgy, the Godfather anti-heroes, right? This was like a throwback. Uh, after Vietnam to be able to just say, look, we know it's good and we know it's bad. We're going to have a fun time with this, right? Uh, and as time has gone on, I think what's really, so I sort of see that as sort of a, a structured, you know, we have, we have heroes, we have meaning in all of these things and sort of like a, a modernist sense of how we think about storytelling. But then when we get to uh, Disney, it's much more, uh, in, my, in my opinion at least, about a postmodernist kind of sense of identity. And we're starting to see the world of Star Wars through all these different kinds of identities. So it's less about that heroic arc, and it's just more about being, you know, being, uh, being a character in that world, and what is it like depending on where you are in, in sort of like the, the social web, which is sort of an interesting move that seems to be getting away very much. And we could see, I thought they were gonna do more with this question of Ray being somebody who's pulled by both the light and the dark, you know, wind up with sort of like a gray Jedi sort of in the middle. But you can see that all through um, Star Wars Rebels. You can see that in many of the comics, like Dr. Afra being that anti-hero. Um, so I think there's less of, in at least the new Marvel stuff, there's less of a push towards that classic sort of Joseph Campbell hero's journey kind of arc and much more into complicated uh, and, and maybe more nuanced kinds of narratives. Fantastic, thank you. So, um, you know, typically if you visit us in the Cary Graphic Arts Collection, I'm, I'm operating a printing press because I'm a printing historian. So I wanna ask one maybe final question if we don't have any more. Um, I read that there was some kind of royalty deal with Marvel where they would not pay royalties until they had surpassed 100,000 copies of the original uh, 1977 Star Wars theme and I and when I hear something like that 100,000 copies that's an extraordinary amount in publishing what are the print runs now in this kind of literature for a uh, Star Wars comic and and how does it how does it compare uh, print runs are a really interesting question for comics now so uh, in 1977 when these original Star Wars comics were printed um, most comic books in the United States were sold on newsstands. Um, uh, most, most comic books you would buy on spinner racks at pharmacies um, or convenience stores or, or things like that. Um, and some of you who are, um, who are closer to, to, my, to my age, my middle age, probably remember like, buying comic books at the grocery store while you were waiting for your parents to buy groceries or whatever. Um, today, that that model is very different. Um, most most single issue comic books today um, are bought and sold in comic book stores um, through what's called the direct market. So beginning around the, the kind of starting in the late seventies and, and especially in the nineteen eighties, comic book publishers kind of grouped together and and created their own distribution network that went beyond what newspapers and magazines were using in the newsstands. So that kind of fundamentally transforms who the audience is. 
Um, you start seeing more comics that are published for adult readers, less for um, a juvenile or adolescent readership. Um, it kind of changes the DNA of comics. So today, um, the numbers are always um, a little loose that you get from publishers. Um, but essentially, if a comic sells, if a comic sells um, in the tens of thousands, that's considered, I believe, today an astronomical success. Um, so similar to television, you know, no, no TV show will ever have an audience the size of the of the episode of Dallas where Jr. gets shot. Similar to that, um, uh, no comic book will ever kind of have the readership today that comic books in the past had. I believe the best-selling comic book ever. Um, is X-Men number one that was published in the early 1990s, um, I believe written and drawn by Jim Lee. Um, and, it's, and it's pretty certain now that nobody will ever surpass that sales mark just because the market is so different now than what it used to be. Thank you, that's really great. I want to be mindful of our time. We're, we're rounding out an hour. I think this could go on and I, I love that um, I got some good feedback from everybody. So we might be doing something maybe on another topic, maybe not Star Wars, maybe something else that the Carrie Collection collects. But I think this is a wonderful beginning to this, um, to this, this brave new world of reaching out to our audience here. And uh, I want to close by telling you that um, you can, let's see, you can obviously browse to your heart's content with the copies that we have at the Carry Collection that we've put online through our RIT Libraries Digital Collections. And I hope you will take a spin through that. And please know that we will be uploading much more content here. Uh, there are over 100 in that original Star Wars series. And so we had hoped before our quarantine event to have all of those 100 uploaded so that you can peruse them. And of course, when we get back to campus, please make an appointment with the Cary Collection at cary.rit.edu and you can view them yourselves in person, which is fantastic. So. Um, without further ado, I want to thank all of our presenters. Thank you so much, Svea, and good luck to you, graduate. Woo, class of 2020. Um, yes, and uh, we're so grateful for you to, for putting them on our digital collection site. Thank you so much to professors uh, Hergenrader and Warden. I think this is just the beginning of what's possible. Thanks for this opportunity. And thank you for my, my co-conspirators at the Cary Graphic Arts Collection, Ella Von Holtem here, and I see our Curator-in-Chief, Steve Galbraith. So thanks so much, everybody, and I will be signing off. Take care.